In part one of this series, Polymath Robert Grant started with the simplicity of Metatron's cube, connecting all 12 dots that surrounded its central singularity. Using only the ancient's tools of compass and straight edge, and drawing only circles, squares, triangles, and diagonals, he derived a cross-section view of all three pyramids on the Giza Plateau, scaled in perfect ratio to each other. In part two, he showed the overhead view of the entire plateau must have been encoded into the original design because the actual pyramid positions and relative sizes can also be located by expanding upon those same basic geometrical intersections revealed in the cross-section view of part one. This visual combination was accomplished simply by increasing the cross-section image by a ratio sufficient to make the Great Pyramid base equal to the width of the Giza Plateau. As extraordinary an intuitive leap as this was, it proved to be the key to unlocking a hitherto unsuspected relationship between these two alternate perspectives. They fit so perfectly, hand in glove, that we can no longer think of the Giza pyramids as being three individual monuments built randomly across separate pharaonic dynasties. Clearly, they were conceived from the start as one complete geometrical masterpiece. So, what magic still awaits us? Is there a third hidden perspective that will integrate with the twin sciences of mathematics and geometry that brought us this far? Around 500 BC, the Pythagoreans considered four subjects fundamental to their quest to find the eternal laws of the universe. They called this group of disciplines, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, the quadrivium. Having successfully employed the first two, we turn our attention now to the third subject. But to do that, we must first take a look at some of the math behind musical theory. But don't worry, we're going to cover only the barest minimum required for our present purposes. Essentially, the Pythagoreans worshipped a structure called the tetractus. Ten dots arranged into a triangle shape of one, two, three, four. They believed that all creation is based upon number, and that this simple series, which sums to ten, which they called the divine number, or decad, contains everything we need to know about the universe. Anything beyond the Decade, they believed, is just a reiteration of the basic truths hidden therein. The infinitely large must, by definition, be made up of the infinitely small. As above, so below. What you're about to see strongly suggests that they may well have been right. First, we're going to extend the tetractus to cover a larger range and assign numbers to it, as follows. Starting with 1 at the apex, we're going to go down the left side, multiplying by 2 at each level. Going down the right side, we'll multiply by 3 at each level. We continue that same process with the interior numbers until all cells have been filled. So in this tetractus model, though the numbers themselves ultimately go on forever, it's all just exponential powers of two and three, we're simply going to assign sound to every cell, starting with a frequency of one hertz at the apex. By international agreement, one hertz is equal to one cycle per second. In other words, a sound wave cycling from positive pressure to negative pressure and back to positive. Visually, it looks like a wave, which is of course why we call it a sound wave. So every cell is now a pure integer value of hertz. Most humans can't hear frequencies below 20 hertz or above 20,000 hertz. We'll hide those frequencies from view. The Pythagoreans discovered that if you double the frequency of a vibration the resulting sound goes up an octave. A C note becomes another C note, just an octave higher. Let's start with the lowest C note we can hear, 
down at the bottom of the piano keyboard at 32 hertz. If we double it, we get the next C up an octave, and so on, all the way up the keyboard. The Pythagoreans also discovered that if you triple the frequency of a note, the sound jumps up by a perfect twelfth. That's an octave plus a fifth. So to jump up only a perfect fifth, you multiply the frequency of three divided by two. In other words, a ratio of three over two. So, starting again at the lowest C on the piano, we can find the hertz frequency value of every perfect fifth interval. All the way up the keyboard. This gives us every possible note in the Western tradition of 12 semitones to one octave, which is called a chromatic scale. But of course, in this example, they're spread across the whole keyboard, eventually ending up at C again. For simplicity, we're ignoring the necessary minor adjustments in orchestral tuning called equal temperament. We're just illustrating here how Pythagoreans found that musical intervals can be expressed by pure integers. The most fundamental scale known throughout history is the pentatonic, or five-note scale. It's been used for centuries, dating back to ancient China, Greece, and Africa. It's made up of the first, second, third, fifth, and sixth notes of the major scale. And it's found in countless simple ethnic melodies. Folk, blues, Bach, pop, you name it. I'm sure we all recognize the Smokey Robinson hit, My Girl, recorded by The Temptations. As we move up an octave and start on middle C, we can add one more note to the grouping, a B, which almost completes the C major scale. Notice how the pattern within this extended tetractus remains the same even as we shift up another octave. Like the Pythagoreans said, it's just reiterations of the basics contained in the 1, 2, 3, 4. If we transpose this pattern to start at G, we find we can complete the whole G major scale with an F sharp found here. Isn't it interesting? Simply by starting at the apex with one cycle per second, one hertz at some point in our tetractus model, based solely on the powers of two and three, remember, we can find all the notes of a perfect major scale. Have you ever wondered why modern orchestras always tune to A? It's because every string instrument has an A string, including the piano, of course. The pitch used worldwide ever since it was first standardized in 1955 tunes to the A above middle C, to 440 Hz. However, a growing movement is slowly beginning to favor Pythagorean tuning, adopting an A equal to 432 Hz. As we can see, it's present in this tetractus model in both the G major scale and the C major scale, starting on middle C. You've probably heard that there are many different tuning systems. This table shows the frequency ratios of notes tuned in two of the most popular ones, just and equal temperament. In the latter, there's exactly the same difference in frequency between all the semitones in the chromatic scale. In the just scale, however, the semitones are not equally spaced. This is by design, so as to accommodate for the fact that the most pleasing sounds to the ear are combinations of notes related by ratios of the smallest pure integers, like 3 over 2, the perfect fifth, or 5 over 4, the major third. What do you know, just as the Pythagoreans discovered?
The just scale attempts to include as many of these pleasing intervals as possible. So, some other semitones have to be adjusted to fit. For instance, in just tuning, the interval between the fundamental C and a semitone above it, C sharp, is a ratio of 1 to 1.0417. Most people can easily hear the difference. This is called a minor second. But play that tone again in just tuning at 1.0417. And now play that same note in equal temperament at 1.0595. Can you hear the difference? Me neither. Most people can't. But so-called music purists fight endlessly over such fine details. But this fine distinction over what constitutes a perfect semitone turns out to be extremely significant because it reveals, at last, what all this musical math has to do with the Giza Plateau and the geometric ratios of the pyramids. You remember how in part two, the cross-section view, we drew a circle whose radius is the height of Khafre, and another whose radius is the height of Khufu. We'll get rid of the Minkora circle, as this is not needed here. We learned already that Sir Flinders Petrie found the plateau to be essentially in ratio 1.222, or 11 over 9, length to width. And we chose to scale that up to a 432 base, for reasons that now become clear concerning Pythagorean tuning. The length of the plateau, accordingly, becomes 528. Remember, the sizes of the pyramids have been expanded in equal ratio, so that the Khufu base matches the width of the plateau. Let's now draw a circle whose diameter is 528, matching the length of the plateau, and another whose diameter is half of that, 264, marking the horizontal halfway line on the plateau. Notice the double Khufu circle is outside the upper boundary of the plateau. Its circumference, scaled up to correct ratio in the overhead view, is 550. So, there's a difference of 22. And here's where the magic comes in. The ratio of the double height of Khufu to the overall length of the plateau is 1.0417, the exact same ratio as the fundamental C to the semitone above C-sharp, found in the just tuning. Let's apply that 22 difference to all 12 semitones in the chromatic scale. Have you spotted it yet? What is 12 times 22? 264, the exact center line of the plateau, which means we can divide the upper half of the plateau into precisely 12 divisions of 22 each. They define a perfect octave. Similarly, we can divide the lower half of the plateau into another 12 divisions of 22 each, forming a second perfect octave. Remember, the overhead view was arrived at by scaling up all pyramids until the Great Pyramid itself has a base that equals the base of the plateau. Only then does it reveal the clue that allows us to divide the whole structure perfectly like this. The Khufu Pyramid is almost perfectly occupying half of the plateau. Only its pyramidion is sitting above the halfway line. But wait a minute. Khufu has no pyramidion, right? Have you ever wondered why that is? Most scholars believe it must have suffered the same fate as the huge blocks of Tura limestone facing stones that were scavenged to build temples and mosques throughout Cairo. But what if there never was a Pyramidion? What if such a design was intended as a metaphor for the invisible divine? Could proof of such an intentional design have been encoded, like all these other geometrically precise synchronicities, into the overall blueprint? That would mean this whole amazing construction is, among other things, a spiritual puzzle. Could it be it has been challenging us all this time to find within the plateau itself the great truth behind the three in one? 
the thrice great Hermes Trismegistus, Toth, Enoch, and yes, Archangel Metatron. Who knows where the edges blur and the mist dissolve within countless trinity incarnations throughout endless yuga cycles. But perhaps musical structure, the third discipline of the quadrivium, is a Rosetta Stone for uncovering the deepest truths behind man's eternal quest. 146.6 meters has been calculated to be Khufu's original height, including the assumed golden capstone. But in its present, much deteriorated state, it measures 138.48 meters up to the 203rd course. Sir Flinders Petrie measured the Great Pyramid to exacting precision. From the base to the 17th course, where the original entrance point is located, and on and on, up to the very last complete course, 201. But he noted a few remaining stones that are the remnants of two other courses, 202 and 203, which begs a serious question, one that no scholar, as far as we're aware, has dared to broach. Yet it's obvious once you think it through. Had there indeed been a Pyramidian, there would have been at least another 16 or 17 courses above these remnants. How could such a colossal number of huge granite stones be removed safely? And why on earth would they be? Stealing the valuable Tura limestone with its attractive smooth white surface is understandable. Plus, it could easily be slid down the sides. But just tossing over hundreds of blocks, each weighing two to five tons or more, seems recklessly dangerous and hardly worth the Herculean effort. Does it not seem more likely that this was actually the ultimate platform atop the monument? Allow your imagination to take this leap of faith, because just maybe, by leaving the tallest, most impressive monument in the world unfinished, maybe this was actually what the designers were intending to signify. The leap of faith required to reach the invisible, indescribable, divine. Wouldn't that be the very essence of magic? And look, the assumed height divided by the actual height today is virtually identical to the musical interval of the semitone in equal temperament tuning. And even if the builders had added a couple of meters more to the platform, say for some decorative embellishments to adorn the summit of their masterpiece, that would come out to 1.0417, the same semitone interval, but in the just scale tuning. So either way, the platform of the Great Pyramid is coinciding exactly with the center line of the Giza Plateau, or to within inches, perfectly balanced between two octaves. Isn't this highly suspicious and hugely suggestive of our premise that perhaps there never was a golden pyramidion at all, but rather a summit where the high priests, priestesses, and new initiates would gather to perform ceremonies of worship to their gods and goddesses. Just think of it. In those days, the whole complex would have been visible for scores of miles in all directions, and this summit would have stood for millennia as the perfect altar. What hymns of praise would Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare have sung as they pointed perpetually toward the stars the abode of all the ancient Egyptian deities. According to the Quadrivium, such eternal music of the spheres must solely obey the timeless laws of mathematics, geometry, and astronomy. Music structure cannot be anything but perfect, and so it is. The ratios inherent in the tuning of the full chromatic scale are, in essence, simple and perfectly balanced upon the pure first integers of the decad. Starting at the center of the chromatic scale, the diminished fifth is actually considered the most inharmonious interval of all. In medieval times, it was called Diabolos in Musica, 
or the devil's cord and was actually banned by the church. Probably that's why it took so long for us to get heavy metal music. Its ratio to the fundamental is seemingly the most complex of all. In Pythagorean tuning, it actually works out to be approximately 45 over 32. But Grant has discovered a simpler geometric solution, which uncovers a deeper mystery here, one that requires part four to fully explain. In it, he will reveal the hidden diminished fifth within the ratios of the Great Pyramid. Moving outward from the center of the scale, we encounter mirror image ratios at every pair of semitones. The perfect fourth and fifth are inversions of each other, expressed in the simple integers two and three, which turn out to be fundamental to the geometry of Khafre. The major third and minor six are inversions of each other, expressed in the integers four and five, the fundamental structure of Menkare. The minor third and major six are inversions expressed in the integers five and six, which again can be found in Khafre. But the groundbreaking, comprehensive new system unveiled in part four reveals some surprises involving other pyramids heretofore unsuspected of being connected to the Giza Plateau. So for now, their identities must wait. The system will also explain the remaining mirrored pairs, the major second and minor seventh, the minor second and major seventh, and the doubled unison and octave. Stay tuned for further magic. <laughs>